Hello, welcome back. It's Joshua Barkley, aka JB Free, to talk to you about sound. Sound is one of the most important waves that we can possibly experience. So let's just get right into it. We're going to describe sound waves and how they are produced. We're going to describe possible standing sound waves in a pipe that has either open or closed ends. We're going to determine the wavelength and frequency of such standing waves. We're going to describe qualitatively what factors determine the speed of sound and understand qualitatively the Doppler effect for sound in order to explain why there is a frequency shift in both the moving source and moving observer case. Let's start off with some sound fundamentals. Sound is a longitudinal wave. It's composed of compressions and rarefactions created by a vibrating object. Here's a demo of that. This is like an example that takes place in a gas. What do you suppose those little dots represent? Molecules. So those are the molecules. And now what I want you to do is look at this wave. And well, what do you call these parts that are all scrunched together? Those are compressions. What do you call the parts in between the compressions that are the molecules are all spread apart? Rare factions. Now, what's interesting is this, well, a couple things. This wave is caused by, this is a piston right here that's moving to the right and to the left, to the right and to the left repeatedly. That's just a vibrating object, the source of every sound. A speaker will do that too, move out and in and out and in. Now, an interesting thing is they've very uh, uh, nicely identified a couple of dots here. We can look at these dots. Now you might think, oh, all the molecules are moving to the right. They are not. It may look like this sound causes molecules to move from the piston to over here. That is not what's going on. Look at the arrow, which is pointing to a red dot, and there's another arrow pointing to a red dot here. Those are particles. If you watch one particle, and they've made some of the particles red so they're easier to watch, but it's true of any particle. What is each individual particle doing in this, uh, this gas? It's just moving back and forth. It's moving to the right, then back to the left, then to the right, then back to the left. This red one's doing that. This one red one's doing that. But so is every particle. Every particle's doing that, moving to the right, moving to the left. They just made these red so we could see that. The particles are moving in what is called simple harmonic motion. They're just moving back and forth, back and forth. But the compressions, you can see the disturbance is what is traveling through this gas and starting here and ending up way over to the right. So you can see the wave velocity is shown by this right here where the velocity of the wave is moving to the right, although each, indiv each individual particle is just moving right, left, right, left, right, left, and never getting anywhere. Similarly, when I make a sound like this, no molecules from here get to your ear. It's only the disturbance that makes it to your ear. This is what your vocal cords are doing when you're talking. They're basically letting out puffs of air, like pushing and pulling. And then what's hitting the, your friend's ear is the disturbance, the longitudinal wave. Now, sound requires a medium. It, cannot, it will not travel in a vacuum. Here's a demo of that. Uh, this is simply a bell in a bell jar which the air is being drawn out of. So you can hear the bell, there's air inside the bell jar, but once the vacuum pump is turned on, the sound is not able to transmit through the air once the air leaves the bell jar. Now you may still hear a little bit of vibration, but the bell is connected to the bottom of this stand, so we may be getting some sound vibration from the stand itself. So you can hear very little, if any, sound there. Once air is allowed to go back into the chamber, by opening this valve, you'll start to hear sound again. Your eardrum goes in when 
think about this, what part of the sound wave, a, of a longitudinal wave, would have to hit your ear for the eardrum to get pushed in? It goes in when the compression hits, and it goes out when the rarefaction hits. In this demonstration, this blue line here represents your eardrum with your head being over here. Try to figure out which parts represent the compressions and which parts represent the rarefactions of this traveling wave. Well, if you can notice that your eardrum goes in when the red parts hit, you'll understand that those are the compressions and the parts that are these blue lines that are spread out are the rarefactions. And they're trying to represent this part right here, those black lines as the air at equilibrium. We'll take one more look at that. Air at equilibrium right there. So your eardrum goes in when compressions hit and then gets pulled out when rarefactions hit, or really more accurately, I should say, the pressure inside your head pushes your eardrum out when the rarefactions hit because you have atmospheric pressure inside your body over here. Here is how a tuning fork creates a longitudinal wave. So notice that when the tines, these are called tines, of the tuning fork go out, they create compressions. When they go back in, they create rarefactions. And this is why a tuning fork produces a sound. And here is how we turn transverse waves on a string, like when I play the guitar, how that gets turned into longitudinal waves in the air. In this demo, this represents the guitar string. It's held right there, that's probably the bridge, and that's the nut. The, you can see that it's the first harmonic that's vibrating. Uh, in this demo, the string moves out, and in the air, it creates a longitudinal compression. That's the red part. When the string moves in, it creates a rare faction. The spread out blue lines. Even if you play a string on an electric guitar without any amplification, you can hear a very soft sound. What makes the sound so much louder is the soundboard of the guitar, which you can see in the demo for forced vibration. If you get the whole soundboard vibrating, your acoustic guitar sounds a lot louder. So this is a standing transverse wave creating a moving longitudinal wave. So you will get a longitudinal sound wave when you pluck that string and make, create a transverse wave on the string, but unless you have what is called a soundboard, it's really not very loud. If you've ever played an electric guitar without an amp, you can hear that guitar is incredibly quiet. What you need is a soundboard, and that is usually the uh, front piece of wood on your guitar. Uh, we can use pretty much anything for a soundboard. Uh, I can uh, have force vibration of a loud soundboard uh, like this wall. Just get this wall vibrating behind me. You can hear how loud, how much louder that is than this. And that's because what I'm doing is I'm getting this entire soundboard, the entire wall, vibrating at the same time. And what happens is when many parts of the board, board uh, like the wall, vibrate at the same time, it creates many longitudinal waves, which are all in phase, leading to what kind of uh, interaction do you call that when you have a bunch of waves that all add up at the same time at your ear? In this case, that is called constructive interference. At your ear, and therefore it sounds louder. So if you get a bunch of stuff vibrating at the same time, uh, you get constructive interference, uh, so the sound is much louder.